the Joe Rogan experience. But it's like times have changed. Yeah, but they're mad at you for something you did when you were little, which is funny. That's one of the things that's going on now, is people yeah. are retroactively getting canceled for things. The, yeah, they, like they did when they were kids. Yeah. It's ridiculous. It, I mean, it's like everything's a permanent stain on, on you. There's no growth. You can't become a better person. You what do you learn. think that is? Like, what's, what's, what is the desire that people have to do that? Like, where's that coming from? Well, you know, there's there's two ways we could talk about it. We could talk about the psychological side of it, which is like a moral purity thing that's going bonkers. Or we could talk about it in terms of the, the ideas, the theory that's fueling this. And that's all about, um, it has this idea that, that comes from French philosophy that, that words and ideas and thoughts and patterns have traces that don't ever really go away. And so if something, you know, used to be associated with something bad and we still use the word, or even if you pretend that it was the case uh, and you still use the word, then it carries this negative trace. So the moral panic and the psychology side of it is fueled by this kind of like stupid idea that words always have to mean kind of what they meant in the first place. Are people aware of that, though? Is it, I mean, is this just conveniently connected to it or, or conveniently similar? Or I mean, do you think that people are actually aware of this concept? I don't think they. I don't think most people do. Like there's this. With, so you know, we're we're generally talking about this whatever woke thing that's happening, yeah. right? And so you got to think of woke kind of like, kind of like a church, right? Like you got. I grew up Catholic, so it's like you got cultural Catholics. Like they kind of go to church, and maybe they go to confession sometimes, and they don't really. Do they do it? But they don't really do it. And then you have like the hardcores. Like I had a friend in high school that like took notes at church. Oh, wow. Right. I'm like, serial it, killer. Yeah. It's like, <laughs> you, you do what? You, you, you take notes. And then, you know, you've got the pastor, and he obviously studies it, or the priest in a Catholic context, and they study it. And then you've got the theologians that really study it. And so the stuff I'm talking about is like theology level. Like, that's like mm. the scholars. And then your average person just wants to feel like a good person. So you've got like the woke academics, like the seriously, the woke people that are teaching it to kids. Yeah. That, that really teach it as, like, critical theory, like critical race theory. That's right. Yeah. yeah. So I mean, those, those are the ones that are probably aware of all the nonsense. They're, they're making the nonsense, actually. Yeah. It's, I think they pick some of it up from culture, you know, from activist groups or whatever, but then they refine it and turn it into something. And it, you know, it has this really weird feeling to it. Like, you get the impression that it's like they're wrestling with their inner demons, and mm. then they're like writing it down. Yeah. It's like, it, like th this book now, White Fragility, right? Robin D'Angelo's book, White Fragility. It's That's the one, one that Matt Taibbi destroyed. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, thank yeah. God for Matt Taibbi. Yeah. It was thank so good. the baby Jesus and Odin. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> it's so good, though, um, because he's right. He's actually yeah. right about it. So if you read the book, there's all these weird vignettes that she tells, these stories. She's like, oh, I went to this potluck for work and. Um, I'm walking around. I walk up, and then I see there's two parties. You were at the park, and there's two groups of people. One of them's all black, and one of them's not. And I had this moment of panic that I might have to be in the all black group. And it's like, lady, what's going on? You know. And then it's like, all white people are racist. Is like her conclusion from this. And it's like, maybe so it's you. She, so she had this panic that she was going to have to party at the park with black people. Yeah. And she was worried that she was racist because of that, and therefore all white people are racist? See, that's what I'm thinking is going on, right? So I'm thinking, I've thought this for a number of years, is that a lot of this stuff where you get these like woke activists doing their blogs or these scholars writing this stuff down, is that they're looking at their own lives. So you have these people that are like, they're walking down the street, you know, maybe whatever. They walk into the hotel, they walk to the restaurant, and they're like, I saw a black guy. And then it's like, I'm not supposed to notice that. And then they start having like this thing in their head. And then they go write an angry blog about how terrible racism is because they're wrestling with it themselves. Mm. It's like Sigmund Freud, right? He had that whole idea um, that everybody wants to have sex with their mothers. And yeah. like your psychology is all how you resolve that problem. <laughs> and it's like, maybe you just wanted to have sex with your mother, Sigmund Freud, you know? And then now it's everybody's a racist is, is kind of the, the vibe of the new thing. And there's like this weird religious kind of thing yeah. happening around it. That's really the thing that gets me is how similar this is to religious or religion, re, not just reli religious ideology, like how rigid it is, but also indoctrination, like religious cults, how they indoctrinate people. And one of my friends, Kurt Metzger, really funny guy who um, was a Jehovah's Witness when he was younger. And so he's mm -hmm. really, really, really sensitive to this stuff. Yep. He's like, I know where this is going. Yep. Like, this is the same thing that I got when I was in the Jehovah's Witness. This That's is right. cult shit. Yeah. It's, it's these rigid ideologies that cannot be challenged. You, you can't 
in any way veer from the course. That's right. And they set you up, right? So every single single one of these things sets you up. So, for example, uh, I was, one of my favorite examples of these kind of like setups, right? It, it, historically, in the book, I talk about um, – Historically, you know, the black feminists came along and they're like, oh, feminism's too white. Feminism isn't paying attention to black feminist issues or black women's issues. And so then these feminists were like, oh, we have to fix that. You know, and they start writing about black issues to the best of their ability. And then three years later, the lady writes a paper saying, oh, you're just sticking black things in and it's fake and you're tokenizing it and you're fetishizing it. And it's like, so you can't do it right. There's, and so that, that is cult the indoctrination yeah. stuff. So it's like you and I could be, you know, talking about something like this and you could say something. And I'm like, don't you think it's a little bit racist? And then the next step is like, what are you going to say? You're going to say yes or no. If you say yes, now you've owned it, right? So yeah. now, now you're like racist. And so I'm like, well, do you interrogate your racism? Like, do you spend time working on that? And so you see, so you're dragging people into it. Yeah. And if you say no, I can say, well, one of the symptoms of participation in, in systemic racism is, is is an inability to see it if you're white and it, it's invisible to you and so maybe you need to look harder when and it seems like you're getting a little defensive Ooh, you know and, and you start it, panicking and then you start panicking and when you start to panic when you start to stress out they're like in literally this lady emailed me the other day this this Indian woman I get a lot of I get an insane number of emails about from people. India no no from Canada oh. but <laughs> an insane number of emails from people who are in different different like uh, levels of stress with different things that are happening in their lives around this woke explosion that's happened mm. since, you know in the last month or so. So this lady's like, I had to go through a brown fragility training at work. What? Yeah, brown fragility is a thing. So it's now not too. even black. Now it's they're working their way down to brown people. Yeah, brown people oh have my fragility. God, white those people poor have fragility. people. So people who racially were sort of like Switzerland, like Indians, like in India, like no one ever thought they were racist. Right. You never you would never hear about racist Indians. Right. Maybe Russell Peters would joke around <laughs> about it. Right. So, you, well, know, you know Russell, the comedian? Yeah, yeah. Now, yeah. now you hear about it. And what they're doing is that they had that what happened was they explained to the ladies, or not the lady, there's like the whole group. It was done in a room, you know, in front of a bunch of people. And they explained uh, brown people in general, like it's some kind of block of brownness or whatever. Uh, brown people have anti-black racism too, and that upholds white supremacy. Oh my god! And then they start just doing this, and it's almost like cold reading, right? Yeah. You know, like the Edwards guy, whatever that guy's name yes. was, had that show. And so it's like they cold read, and they wait for somebody to start looking like they're getting the sweat or something happening, and then they say, "Now what we need to do? Now that we've introduced this idea of of your brown fragility, is we need to in your anti-blackness is we need to interrogate the feelings that came up." And so they go one by one through the room. And made every single one of them confess their feelings. Like, who's not going to participate? And here's that double bind because it gets to you, right? And so, what do you say? You say, "Well, I don't really know what you're talking about." Well, and they're going to you, say you're ignoring it. Yeah, you're exactly. It. And then if you confess to it, then then you're falling in. So this is straight up cult indoctrination stuff. It really is like those people in Game of Thrones. You, you remember those those people that almost like took over the crown, yeah, <laughs> like, and kidnapped Cersei. That that. It, it, mm. it is. Yeah. It's like that sort of pattern, for whatever reason, just seems to reoccur with humans. You know, and I think it comes down to our natural religious impulses. Yeah. That I think, I mean, you, you know pretty well from my background, you know, I don't believe in God. I, I'm an atheist. And, How dare you? Oh, uh, well, you know, we get along. <laughs> and so it's like... I still do think that we have certain impulses underneath that lead people to build religious structures mm -hmm. around themselves and have religious, you know, thoughts and feelings and want to have spiritual development and all of this. And so religions can kind of do one of two things. Um, you know, I used to be kind of hard ass about religion and like tough, like, you know, uh, angry atheist kind of picture, but I've thought about it more, and which you're not allowed to think about things and change your mind now, but I did. And um, what I realize is that some religions look up. They're like looking at God and they're afraid of sin, but they, they're paying attention to God. They're thinking about renewal. They're thinking about redemption. They're thinking about forgiveness. And then some religions look down and all they do is look at the sin mm. and they focus on the sin. And that's where the witch hunts came from. That was when the Calvinists got like, you know, fire and brimstone, Jonathan Edwards screaming, you know, mm. sinners in the hands of an angry God. You're hanging on a spider's thread above the fires of hell, and God d should knock you into it because everybody's full of sin. Next thing you know, they're killing witches. So it's like you start focus. If you look up, you know, then religion I, can be great. It can actually lead people, you know, if they spiritual development, community, so on. But if you're looking down, you're going to start obsessing about 
every if you're obsessing about sin, you're going to start obsessing about everybody else's sin too. Yes, because uh, you're going to want to like. There's this feeling with again reading Robin D'Angelo's White Fragility. There's this feeling, like uh, that she doesn't want to feel alone. Like she has these struggles and she doesn't want to be alone. So, so she's like, a white lady. Oh yeah, Robin D'Angelo's a white lady who <laughs> goes in and for like twelve thousand dollars a pop does these corporate seminars. What? And, yeah, twelve twelve grand for two hours and teaches. And, she goes in and tells white people that they're racist and then <sighs> like interrogates their feelings when they when they get defensive about it. Oh my goodness! It's like the biggest corporate corporate training hustle ever. And her idea of white fragility, you can't disagree with it. There's no way to disagree. I've absolutely like rammed it on some people on Twitter who are these Wokies that come and try to trash me. And I just say, you know, that looks a little bit like white fragility. And I give some reason that's kind of out of the literature. And then they are like, I can't have white fragility. Uh, you know, I'm whatever. And it's like, oh, that's definitely, you're getting defensive. Defensiveness is one of the symptoms of white fragility. You just want to deny your complicity in the system of racism that you benefit from. And it's, <laughs> it's just like, you can't get away from it. because right, the that end- kind of language, like what you just said, is like, it, like you, that's like a checkmate. 